Welcome to Bread and Roses. Hi everyone, I'm Aram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Boris Puya. In this week's program, we're going to be talking about the hijabi, a hijabi Barbie. Say what? <laughs> Crazy <laughs> stuff. Interview this week is with Otisa Farhman, Iranian contemporary dancer. Interesting interview. Yeah, she's great. Our insane fatwa is from the grand, grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and with another stupid fatwa about it being haram to like Facebook pages and uh, follow people who you're not related to. Got to get married first. Temporarily <laughs> married, though, phew, not permanently. And Slice of Life is a, a third marathon in Afghanistan, a mixed race marathon. In your face, Islamists. Stay with us. Mattel, the producers of Barbie, the infamous Barbie doll, have a hijabarbi, hijabi, hijabarbi, and it's basically a hijabi Barbie, you know, which is quite interesting when you think about it, especially because it is part of their Shiro campaign. So you're a hero because you're wearing a, a, a hijab, basically. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's been brought about because... Uh, Olympian Ibtahaj, who's won a medal, but she's wore a hijab. She is the hero of uh, a Barbie doll. It's interesting. She's she's actually been given this role not because she's won a medal in Olympics, but specifically because she's wearing a hijab. Yeah, I mean the the Mattel vice president mentioned specifically the fact that she's embraced her difference. And again, you know, what's really interesting about this is the fact that the hijab, which is such a tool to control women, to hide them away because they're seen to be the source of fitna if they're not veiled, is celebrated in this way. So you actually become a hero. Uh, it's really an anti-hero, isn't it? No, absolutely. I, I have no idea uh, what would they say to the women who are struggling for freedom and they're trying to throw away the way in Iran, in Afghanistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Iraq, you name it, in Middle East and North Africa. What have you got to say to those women who are fighting every day? Well, Barbie and Metallica. Well, that's Islamophobic, isn't it's, it? No, but I think what, what they are actually doing, they are enforcing those oppressions in Middle East and many countries in Europe and in America, the young girls and women who are fighting Islamic imposition of hijab. And that's a bit despicable. Yeah, act. and especially, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that it, you know, when you have a doll wearing a hijab, you, you are normalizing reinforcing this. Reinforcing it. Yes. And you're reinforcing it, you're making it seem very normal. And in fact, you know, it's not a normal thing. It's not something that uh, very many women do out of choice. If you look at it on a vast social scale, you know, all across the world, it is very much an imposition for a vast majority of people. And particularly when it comes to children, it is child abuse, you know, because it tells girls that they're different from boys, they're sexualized at a very young age. And who plays with Barbie dolls? Girls do, you know. And you look at this campaign in line with the imposition of the hijab on four-year-olds in yeah. British schools. There's nothing, it's nothing, it's this sinister. is not really something to aspire to. And this is really what's happening, Mariam, is that the commercial directors of, uh, you know, Barbie, they've actually, they've realized there's a market under the slummists, just name it, under the slummist, is a market for that, and they're, they're cashing in. That's what they're doing. And that's at the expense of women who are fighting against the hijab and Islamists, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, women's rights, girls' rights, I mean, it is very shameful, really. And for it to be celebrated as a Shiro campaign is just beyond, and beyond you know, uh, understanding even. It's really thumbs down to Mattel. And, you know, let me add, I mean, Barbie is a hideous doll to begin with. It is, you know, if you make Barbie into a normal human being, she would be anorexic. You know, and now 
when you think of this Shiro campaign, it's really a continuation of that same misogynist view of women. Either she has to have her tits out to here and a waist, you know, this small, where she most probably can't breathe, she can't swallow most probably. There's no, you know, there's nothing there for her yeah. to digest her food. Or she has to be veiled. Again, it's sort of, you know, the ideal woman in a misogynist uh, point of view or from a religious point of view. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what they do, they're cashing from. in, they're supporting the Islamist, mm -hmm. uh, a normalizing Islamist narrative, and it's disgusting. So thumbs down to Barbie, thumb, thumbs down to Metal. The Jarby. The Jarby. Disgusting. Welcome to South and welcome to our program. Thank you so much. I wanted to speak to you about your work. You're a dancer and uh, particularly you focus on contemporary dance. Tell me why you like contemporary so much. Uh, I think uh, contemporary doesn't have any limits and that is the main reason that I, I really enjoy doing it because uh, all of my life there was limits for everything and contemporary dance is so flexible so you can put in your story in different way and your body is your tongue or your uh, language to talk to people and whenever I dance I don't feel who I am with all of the text like I'm a woman or uh, how old I am uh, the focus is I am here now and I want to tell a story and that is the main reason for me you mentioned before that you think uh, dance is very political and again you talk about the restrictions explain that a bit more for people with my experience who are born and raised in Iran uh, dance wasn't all, all the time about art and dance was forbidden so um, my experience uh, that I had like all the time it was like um, it was forcing me to see dance not in an artistic way also political way but uh, to be honest I am pretty uh, free of and I'm not in any political groups but my main reason is to put question marks in people's head when they see a performance and then they can rethink about political views that they have. So I cannot say that I don't think about politics when I do dance, but in the other way I don't give directions. I just give question marks and image so people can choose the answer. Because I think for me it's so hard to give the answer to people. One of the things you talk about too is the importance of dance for children, right? Yes. Uh, you work with Swedish children, including those who are uh, refugees. Explain why dance is so important to so many children and why it needs to be promoted even more. Uh, I think like during the lifetime, how much we touch each other, skin to skin. I think like in the new generation, uh, they are just uh, used to touch uh, like uh, laptops or like phones, or, like, just the screens. But come on, we are humans. We need each other. We need love. And I think love is only transfer from skin to skin. So the way that I think can make people comfortable to touch each other is dance. Because then they have a reason why they touch each other. Or they have a, what do you say? They have something between each other, so that reason makes them touch each other. You cannot make people like, oh, let's let's uh, get together and touch each other. But dance, it would be a reason for them to get interested to touch each other and try to communicate because so many newcomers uh, or people in other countries, we don't speak in the same language, and language is always a problem. You know, no matter how much you know a language, still there are some feelings that you can't find the right word. But dance doesn't have any limits. You can say a lot. And that is my focus, as I said in the beginning, like dan contemporary dance doesn't have limits. So it's so good to share this with more uh, babies from like age one month till plus 60. I think everyone can dance uh, as uh, Pia Bach said dance 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 otherwise we are lost
And you talk about, um, in the conversation we were having before, uh, the positive impact you see on children when they do actually start dancing, is especially children who've been to, through trauma. Yeah. Can you talk about that a bit? <laughs> People that are uh, coming from drama or they have some uh, experiences, which I don't know all of it, but it can be sexual harassment, it can be like they got divided so much in their life so they don't even know about other genders or other, you know, it's we are now like a rainbow. And with dance, you get a, like we try out to swap the gender, we try it out to not really think about also gender when we are dancing. And that's happened when you, when you lose yourself in a group and try to trust each other. Because when you touch someone, the, you start to build the trust. And also this helps a lot of young people to, to try to trust each other again and erase all of this misunderstanding pictures that media has built on their mind. Like so many people like have bad images of refugees or newcomers because they never even saw them. They just see medias with horrible news and they think, okay, all of the ref refugees are like that. My main vision is to, to just show that a group of people with different exper experiences, not only refugees, like different like students, like, uh, you know, in cities it's different people, tourists or people just visit for a short time. They can be together and dance together and that's it. So simple. Uh, and hopefully the, I can grow it more and more. I, I think this can really heal the society because we are losing trust. Nowadays there is less trust between people compared to World War I. How many people we trust? Dance can raise people like, to trust. Um, one of the um, things you mentioned too is uh, you know, or, or we were talking about was the fact that when there are cuts in schools, for example, music, dance, art, that's the first things to go. But they're so important for child development, apart from building trust and also uh, the, the, the idea of touch. Exactly. It's like uh, when I, right now I'm, I'm teaching dance like to small kids and whenever I tell them like in my home country, I couldn't go to any dance school when I'm in your age. They were like, like three years old. They're like, how? And they are get so upset. Some of them crying. They can't believe why dance is illegal or why dance is uh, forbidden. I think because people, I don't know, system is really scared that people start to trust each other or they start to build connections because dance I think it's really helpful for schools because it's a, like group working together and there are so many tra uh, like trainings that build a big trust between kids and also it helps them because after a while girls and boys start to get divided by gender Dance can, you know, play with that. It can be play with all of the definitions and, you know, build up new definitions to people's, like, young people's head. So I think it's very important that kids, like, from young age, I say, like, one month, start to dance and move because the whole world is moving. The gal galaxy is moving. The sun is moving. The earth is moving. In our bodies, the blood is moving all the time. Everything is moving around us, the air. And how can we just still stay still? I think dance is very important for human beings and it can heal us. It healed me. So. You know, you, you said that you weren't really allowed to dance and you had to study something completely different, architecture. Um, even though there were all these restrictions, why did you keep persisting on, you know, I want to dance, I want to dance, and then you're now in a company and you're doing that, uh, you know, something you love. Why, why did you have to keep persisting at it? I think from young age I was such a girl that I, whenever people tell me like something to not to do, I was, and I felt like it was my right to do it, I was fighting till the last breath to do it. Uh, and I think for me it was no excuse that someone or a system tell me not to dance and I felt it was ridiculous. That is why I think bad rules are made to be broken 
So I saw myself as a tool to break this stupid rule that people cannot dance. I mean, it was a few years ago, like they arrest a group of young people, they dance with a happy song. What? I mean, they didn't even do anything in the film. And I felt like responsible as a new generation to show that I can break this and I can encourage a lot of dancers in Iran to follow their passion. And there is a way they can, you know? Their passion and their dreams become true. I feel responsible for those who don't have this right now and they are wishing to have it. As a final question, I wanted to ask you about your company. I mean, you do uh, different dances, all in contemporary dance, is it? And um, But today, you, you're at, at this event we're at in Köln, you are uh, doing something that you've choreographed yourself. Can you explain what it is that you're trying to do with this uh, piece of work? And this performance for, that I'm going to do tonight is a very short version of my performance that I did uh, in February in Heidelberg Festival. Uh, and uh, the piece called Black and White. So it's a two sections, black section and uh, white section. Black section is about like uh, struggles that people have with darkness that they have. And I, I think everyone has their own darkness. So my play was to, to try to communicate with it instead of denying it. And the white section is about more about freedom and dances for me is, my, is like my, uh, my way to break things, as I said before. So it's like a white piece and my hopes to, to be perfect in life, which I couldn't never. I think I, I can't be never a perfect dancer because I, I couldn't start dancing in like uh, schools from young age but uh, still I am fighting to go to the perfection direction and what is perfection right so it's it's just different images with the frame and with the plastic like with the frame it's like showing up the norms that we have in life like what is what is the normal woman should do or what is good what is bad the, the borders that I'm holding the frame that you see later on and then I break it so it's kind of a short pictures of my life maybe the white section but tonight I, I have shortened it up to 15 minutes and also um, I'm so happy that uh, still it's 15 minutes but I guess it can say a lot you also use your body, uh, I think uh, you use u nudity as well, yes. explain why. For me nudity in art is, or artists who use nudity is uh, all about honesty. That behind all of this makeup and all of this, I am Atusa, this is me. I'm, and it's all about honesty, like it's honest picture of me without any mask because all of my life I used to cover myself putting mask on myself hide myself and it was a stage that I questioned myself in front of a mirror that who I am what am I doing and I think all of the artists because it's vulner vulnerable image when you get naked and people just sitting and watching you but I think on the other hand can encourage people to to start to accept each other or it can raise a question mark that with my experience I am daring to do this and I don't really care about people what they think about me. this is me Atusa I am what I am brilliant thank you very much thank you The grand supreme spiritual leader Ali Khamenei, the grandest, Mufti, grandest, the big stupidest, guy. stupidest fatwa issuer. Big guy. He's the big, the, big the, honcho. The, the big top honcho. The big guy. You are the <laughs> most stupid. Your fatwa is going to be the more stupid. I mean, Clearly, listen to this one. There this, is this, a scientific correlation yeah. here. Anyway, he's issued a fatwa saying that you can't even like something on Facebook 
or follow someone of the opposite sex if you don't have a religiously acceptable relationship. But there's always a but when it comes to these. You two. can, you you can do that actually, but you have to What's be temporary. But? You have to be temporary married. Oh. Well, before you do that, temporary and married. one of the preconditions to get temporary married, you have to have a temporary marriage to like something <laughs> on Facebook. Oh, that because that's that's class as uh, as intimate relationship. Mm. And to actually get temporary mm. marriage, you that have to sense. listen. You have to ask the father if the or the person, grandfather. If the woman is a virgin, of if course. The virgin, Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Non virgin, it hasn't said anything. Okay. So you have to ask the father or the grandfather or another father or some male sort of relative in I a family you. get permission to have temporary marriage so you could like them. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> rushing out to get their temporary marriages. And only then can you like and follow someone on Facebook. So you have been warned. Otherwise, you know, you're going to hell. Stupid fat okay. fall goes all through the rack. How about that? Over 200 girls ran in the third Bamiyan Marathon race in Afghanistan. It's the only mixed gender race in the country and of course it is a wonderful sight to see women girls running alongside men and boys yes and celebrating life uh, many people came across uh, from different surrounding countries men and women came together to celebrate running together and having a life together and yeah. that is beautiful this is beautiful and see. especially see. given the fact that it's something that's frowned upon of course not so 30 years ago in Af Afghanistan but today it is frowned upon and so it is quite a challenge for women to mm. run a lot of women find it found it very difficult to break free and do it and that's why it's actually run by a non-profit group as well yeah and, uh, and that says running yeah. free and and people have come in and when they ask uh, some of the participants how does that running what sort of feeling does it gives you she says it gives me a feeling of freedom freedom and, and, and being strength. and being myself i mean that this is beautiful yeah. and congratulations to people who've organized it and they've Definitely. done they've created the beautiful slice of life We've reached the end of our program. We'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, bye. Goodbye. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set 
every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.